thing. Will you all pray with me, please? God, uh, your cross means different things to different people. And maybe we have some baggage <laughs> that we carry that goes with this cross thing. I don't know. Uh, would, would you just get through it all uh, and, and speak to us in our need this morning? Bless the words of my mouth and the words of meditation in our hearts and the words of Scripture. Take them and make them a, a life-giving word, a loving word, we pray in the name of Jesus, the word who became flesh for us. Amen. So I have been to uh, El Salvador uh, several times. And on a visit in 2005 for the observance of the 25th anniversary of the assassination of Roman Catholic Archbishop Oscar Romero uh, during the Salvadoran Civil War, and if you don't know, during that war from 1980 to 1992, over 5,000 Salvadorans were forcibly disappeared by the government, and thousands more were arrested and tortured and executed. I had the opportunity to visit uh, Lutheran Bishop Medardo Gomez, a contemporary of Oscar Romero, who survived the Salvadoran Civil War, but also was arrested and tortured during the war. And in the sanctuary of the Lutheran Church of the Resurrection in San Salvador, Bishop Gomez showed me the subversive cross. During a Lenten season in the midst of the Civil War, a parishioner made a large wooden cross that lay on the floor in front of the altar. And on it, people wrote their prayers, often just a word or two to represent a prayer. They wrote uh, the names of family and friends who had been disappeared, arrested and tortured or executed. They wrote short phrases like, you know, how long, Lord, uh, hear our cry, uh, all of this in Spanish, of course. Or they wrote, uh, ayudame, help me, and justicia, justice, and, and hope, uh, esperanza, and, and faith, and grace, la fe y la gracia, la paz y la paz de Cristo, peace, and the peace of Christ. Uh, amor and el amor de Dios, love and the love of God, and compassion y perdón, compassion and forgiveness. And then the police came to arrest Bishop Gomez. And when the police commander saw this cross, he ordered it taken up and taken to the police station. He arrested the cross, along with Bishop Gomez, because, he said, the cross was subversive. And so there, the subversive cross sat leaning against the wall in the police station, witnessing to the police who engaged in torture and more false arrests and political persecution, and giving comfort and courage to all the victims who were brought there for questioning and imprisonment and worse. And then after the Civil War, Bishop Gomez went to the police station and he demanded the return of the cross. And so now you can go to La Iglesia de la Resurrección, the, the Church of the Resurrection in San Salvador, and you can see the subversive cross where it has been kept and displayed in reverence and sometimes in celebration ever since. And that is the spirit in which the gospel reading this morning from Matthew 16 uh, declares, and I, I want you to, to hold your cross maybe tightly now and look at it as I read these words again. Jesus declares, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. 
to take up the cross and follow Jesus is a subversive act. It is to go against the establishment and the established way of doing things. To be counter-cultural and follow the one who said, Behold, I am doing a new thing because my ways are not your ways, says the Lord. Set your mind on divine things and not on human things, Jesus said in our gospel reading this morning. For behold, I am making all things new. It's illustrated in Peter's response to Jesus' teaching that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and be killed and on the third day be raised. Only I doubt that Peter and the disciples even heard that last part about being raised because they were so taken aback by the first part about being killed and suffering. And that's where they were stuck, that Jesus would undergo great suffering at the hands of the religious and political establishment and be killed. As we read last week in Matthew chapter 16, Peter was bold to confess when Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am, that Jesus was the Messiah, the son of the living God. Only now, Jesus is saying the Messiah, the son of the living God, will suffer greatly and be killed. That's not the way it's supposed to work. At least not in the hearts and the minds of Peter and the disciples. That's not what God sent the Messiah, the chosen one, to do, uh, at least not in the vision and the understanding of Peter and the disciples. God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you, Peter declares in rebuke. In his and the other disciples' understanding and vision, the chosen one of God must be the son of David, the, the great warrior king of Israel, come in the spirit of the prophet Elijah, who took up the sword and slew the prophets of Israel's enemies. The Messiah would get rid of the Romans and the religious leaders who collaborated with them and end all oppression in a great and final battle that would establish God's reign forever, you know, an eternal victory. And a lot of Christians today still want Jesus to do that and believe that he will when Christ comes again, or we wouldn't have pictures like this one on the internet uh, and for sale in Christian bookstores and gift shops. Only that's not the way that God did things in the first century, nor is it the way God will apparently do things in the end times. God says no to violence, even to using violence to bring redemption. God says no to what is called redemptive violence because apparently it doesn't work. You know, all those who live by the sword, even if they take up the sword to do something good in the end, all those who live by the sword will perish by the sword, says the Messiah, the son of the living God. So might does not make right. No one gets to claim God is on our side when they choose violence, and there are no holy wars. I am doing a new thing, God declares. I am doing a new thing on the cross. Look at your cross. Hold your cross and remember the cross was the Roman establishment's institutionalized 
form of violence or, or capital punishment. It was supposed to be a deterrent to violence and somehow redemptive, but it doesn't work. It's a myth. Jesus says no to the myth of redemptive violence, and Jesus takes all of the violence upon himself by taking up the cross and suffering violence and dying on the cross and then rising again. And Jesus invites those who would follow him to also reject the myth of redemptive violence and take up the subversive cross and follow the one who makes all things new. To take up your cross and follow Jesus is to say no to violence, to say no to the myth of redemptive violence. Look at that cross again. Hold on. To take up your cross and follow Jesus is a subversive act. And it's easier said than done. There are times I confess to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, when you know I've just had it. Okay, I, I've had it with Putin uh, having his way in Ukraine and and pussyfooting around about what we can and cannot do to stop this madman from firing missiles into cities and killing civilians, de destroying the infrastructure that supports the basic necessities of life, power plants and and ports to to import medicine, export grain, and, and murdering innocent mothers and children and grandparents. I, I've had. I've had it with the, with the mass shootings, targeting people because of their race or gender or sexuality, you know, attacking schools and churches, synagogues and mosques. There are times when I've had it with the culture wars and the partisan politics, uh, the vitriolic, violent, degrading, and demonizing language that's being used and that you cannot convince me does not lead to more physical violence uh, and hatred. There are times when, when I just want to round up all the people in all the hate groups and lock them up and throw away the key. And there's a host of other problems and issues that, that are very complex, uh, beyond my pay grade, as they say. Uh, and yet, it appears to me that, that we're not really doing anything about them. We, we create more commissions and task force and, and, and bureaucracies that, that accomplish nothing. And, you know, I've had it. You know, I want to kick some butt and take some names, OK? You know. <laughs> And I was worried about whether it was going to be okay for a pastor to say that in church. Apparently it is. Uh, I, I, I'm just trying to be honest here, okay? I once was a pacifist. I was. I was completely committed to nonviolence. Until as a pastor, I was confronted with domestic violence requiring intervention by force because when the abusers did not go peaceably their violence was met with violence to stop the violence and prevent further violence and that seemed to be the only way in the moment the lives of innocent women and children were immediately literally at stake and that was the way I and others involved uh, saw to do it I wore the uniform of this nation's military for almost 24 years, albeit as a chaplain, you know, a non-combatant, but I have been to war nonetheless. I have seen the horror of it, and I've seen the horror of not taking any action and letting the terrorists and the torturers have their way with innocent men and women and children. My point is 
Taking up your cross and following Jesus is not easy. It's counter-cultural. It goes against all my inclinations when I've had it and I want to kick butt and take names. You know, it's subversive, which means it's messy, it can get very complicated and difficult to figure out in certain situations. You know, it's not always black or white. A lot of times, it's very gray. It's not always clear. A lot of times, it's very muddy. And there are times when, despite the fact that the concept of redemptive violence is a myth and it doesn't really work, I buy into it anyway, and I want to go there, and sometimes I do. How about you? It's a struggle, if we're honest. And it's not a one-time thing. We are repeatedly presented with opportunities to take up our cross and follow Jesus. You know, every time I've had it and I want to lock them up and throw away the key. It's an ongoing, continuous struggle. And the good news is we are not alone in that struggle. There is one who struggled and overcame, who was crucified and rose again to journey with us. And there is grace and forgiveness when we falter and we fail, or we are confused and we can't see clearly, or don't know what to do. No, Father, forgive them, Jesus said on the cross. They don't know what they are doing. Or when we, we do know what to do, and we're afraid, and we don't do it. Father, forgive them. Jesus still prays. The fruit of the subversive cross is there for us. The amazing grace of God in Christ, the crucified and the risen one, is that we are forgiven when we fail to take up our cross and follow. The amazing grace of God in Christ on the cross is that Jesus suffered and died for you and for me, and for Peter, and all of the disciples, for, for all people, for all of creation, even and especially when we are stumbling blocks on the side of Satan, whether knowingly or unknowingly. Hold on to your cross. We struggle to take up our cross and follow Jesus, and we are invited to find forgiveness, and grace, and comfort, and strength in the cross, the subversive cross of Jesus Christ, our Savior and lover of our souls. Thanks be to God. Amen.